Welcome back to History for Today and my first chapter of U.S. History 2. Now I want to talk about farmers. Wall Street owns the country, said the populist leader Mary Elizabeth Lease to farmers around 1890. It is no longer a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, but a government of Wall Street, by Wall Street, and for Wall Street. Farmers, who remained a majority of the American population through the first decade of the 20th century, were hit especially hard by industrialization. The expanding markets and the technological improvements that increased efficiency also decreased commodity prices. Commercialization of agriculture put farmers at the mercy of bankers and of railroads and of large equipment manufacturers like McCormick. Fluctuating global markets caused wide swings in the prices that farmers could get for their produce. Many farmers fell further and further into debt and then lost their land and then were forced to enter the industrial workforce or, especially in the South, to become landless farm workers or sharecroppers. The rise of industrial giants also reshaped the American countryside and reshaped the Americans who called it home. Railroad spur lines and telegraph lines and credit arrived in farm communities and began linking rural Americans, who were still a majority of the U.S. population, with towns and with regional cities, and then with the big financial centers in Chicago and New York, and oftentimes to world markets. Meanwhile, improved farm machinery, easy credit, and the latest consumer goods began flooding into the countryside. But new connections and new conveniences came at a price. Farmers found that their financial security depended on a national economic system that was subject to rapid price swings, to rampant speculation, and very limited regulation. And many came to believe that the system was enriching parasitic bankers and industrial monopolists at the expense of the many, the laboring farmers who fed the nation by producing its crops and its farm goods. Their dissatisfaction with an erratic and an impersonal system put a lot of them at the forefront of what would become possibly the most serious challenge to the established political economy of the Gilded Age. Farmers organized and launched their challenge first through cooperatives and the Farmers Alliance, and later through the politics of the People's Party or the Populist Movement. Mass production and corporate consolidation spawned these giant trusts that monopolized nearly every sector of the U.S. economy in the decades after the Civil War. In contrast, the economic power of the individual farmer was threatened by plummeting commodity prices and rising indebtedness. The farmers met at Lampasas, Texas in 1877 and organized the first Farmers Alliance to restore some economic power to farmers as they negotiated with railroads and merchants and bankers. The farmers reasoned that if they banded together, they might gain some economic leverage, similar to that held by big business. They could share machinery, they could bargain collectively with wholesalers, and they could negotiate higher prices for their crops. Cooperatives were a well-established economic tool that had been popular with liberal reformers in Great Britain and America since the early 19th century. Organizers spread from town to town across the South and the Midwest and the Plains, holding evangelical style camp meetings, distributing pamphlets and establishing over a thousand Alliance newspapers. As the Alliance spread, so too did its nearly religious vision of the nation's future as a cooperative commonwealth that would protect the interests of the many from the predatory greed of the few. Sounds a lot like the vision of the Knights of Labor, right? At its peak, the Farmers Alliance claimed a million and a half members meeting in 40,000 local sub-alliances. The Alliance's cooperatives spread across the South as well between 1886 and 1892 and claimed more than a million members at their high point, 
While most of them failed financially, these cooperatives that their members called philanthropic monopolies inspired the farmers to organize to cope with their economic difficulties. But cooperation was only part of the alliance message. In the South, alliance-backed Democratic candidates won four governorships and 48 congressional seats in 1890. But at a time when falling prices and rising debts seemed to threaten the survival of family farmers, the two major political parties seemed incapable of representing the needs of poor farmers. So Alliance members abandoned the Democrats and organized their own political party, the People's Party, or the Populists, as they became known. Populists attracted supporters across the nation by criticizing the deep flaws they saw in the political economy of Gilded Age America, flaws that both major political parties had refused to address. Veterans of earlier fights for currency reform, disaffected industrial workers, and proponents of the benevolent socialism of Edward Bellamy's best-selling novel, Looking Backward, as well as the champions of Henry George's farmer-friendly single tax proposal, joined the Alliance members in this new party. The People's Party nominated a former Civil War general, James B. Weaver, as their presidential candidate in their first national convention in Omaha, Nebraska on July 4th, 1892. At the Omaha convention, the populists adopted a platform that crystallized the Alliance's cooperative program into a coherent political vision. The platform's preamble, written by a Minnesota populist named Ignatius Donnelly, warned that the fruits of the toil of millions had been stolen to build up colossal fortunes for the few. The Omaha platform and the larger populist movement wanted to counter the scale and the power of monopolistic capitalism with an engaged and modern and equally powerful federal government. The platform proposed nationalizing the country's railroad and telegraph systems to ensure that essential services would be run in the interests of the people rather than for the profits of wealthy investors. The people's tax money and public land had been used to build the railroads. Uh, to deal with the lack of currency and credit available to farmers, the platform advocated postal savings banks. It called for the establishment of a network of federally managed warehouses called sub-treasuries, which would extend government loans to farmers who stored crops in the warehouses as they waited for higher market prices. And then to save debtors, it promoted an inflationary monetary policy by monetizing silver. The platform called for the direct election of senators and for the secret ballot to ensure that the federal government would serve the people rather than entrenched partisan interests. And finally, a graduated income tax would protect Americans from the establishment of an American aristocracy. Populists believed that these efforts would help to shift economic and political power back toward the nation's producing classes. In the populists' first national election campaign in 1892, James Weaver received over a million votes, and he received 22 electoral votes, which was a startling performance for a third-party candidate that signaled a bright future for the populists. When the Panic of 1893 exacerbated the Long Depression, the populist movement won further credibility and gained even more ground. The Kansas populist Mary Elizabeth Lease, one of the movement's most fervent speakers, called on farmers to raise less corn and more hell. Populist stump speakers crossed the country, blaming the greed of business elites and corrupt party politicians for causing the crisis that was fueling America's widening inequality. Southern orators like Texas's James Cyclone Davis and Georgian Tom Watson stumped across the South, decrying the abuses of Northern capitalists and of the Democratic Party. Popular pamphlets such as W.H. Harvey's Coins Financial School and Henry Lloyd's Wealth Against Commonwealth provided a populist perspective on economic issues. In the 1894 midterm elections, populists elected six senators and seven representatives to Congress. 
a third party seemed destined to conquer American politics. So what happened? Populism, it turned out, still faced substantial obstacles, especially in the South. The failure of the Alliance-backed Democrats to live up to their campaign promises had driven some Southerners to break with the Democratic Party, the party of their forefathers, and to join the populists. Southern Democrats responded to this populist challenge with electoral fraud and racial demagoguery. The Farmers Alliance had failed to challenge the pervasive white supremacy of the American South in their call for a grand union of the producing class. Their constitution had banned black membership, saying, unfortunately, that the Alliance was a social organization quote, where we meet with our wives and daughters. Black farmers responded by establishing the Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union in 1886. Their organization spread quickly and grew to 1.2 million members by 1891. But Southern racism was too formidable. The Colored Farmers Alliance went into rapid decline after the White Farmers Alliance attacked the group for sponsoring strikes of cotton pickers. Racial mistrust and division remained the rule, even among the populists. Populists opposed the corruption of the two major political parties, but this unfortunately did not make them automatic champions of interracial democracy. As North Carolina's populist Senator Marion Butler explained to an audience of his constituents, we are in favor of white supremacy, but we are not in favor of cheating and fraud to get it. In fact, across the South, Populist and Farmers Alliance members were often at the forefront of the movement for disenfranchisement and segregation. So that's an unfortunate mistake that limited their effectiveness. Despite its racial failures, though, populism exploded in popularity. The first major political movement to tap into the discomfort of many Americans with the disruptions that had been brought on by industrial capitalism, the People's Party seemed poised to capture political victory. And yet, even as populism gained national traction, the movement was stumbling. The party's leaders found it difficult to shepherd what remained a diverse and loosely organized coalition of reformers together into unified political action. The Omaha platform was a very radical document, and some state party leaders decided they'd rather pick and choose from among the reforms that it proposed. More importantly, the major parties were too strong and were too well organized. And the Democrats, it turned out, were preparing to embrace many populist ideas and to inaugurate a new era in American politics. And we'll talk about that next. But before we go, a couple of questions. Why do you think the People's Party gained influence so quickly in American politics? And then secondly, what prevented the populists from becoming a permanent third party?